All right, so I think we are live, everyone. Uh, I hope you are having a great day, Mr. Iron Solomon. Thank Thanks, you for coming brother. back to us. That is so exciting. Yeah, my pleasure, man. Definitely. Thanks for having me again. Um, so yeah, we'll guess we'll, we'll get started. Uh, welcome back to Bridge the Gap. Um, and uh, as was pointed out to me, I should work on more of an intro, so I'll practice that right now. So right. And I was I rewatched our first interview, and I kind of like what I did there. So explaining what the concept of Bridge the Gap is. Oh. So it's basically a show where we sit there and we get folk like you, Mr. Iron Solomon, who is very knowledgeable about many things related to hip hop, battle rap, all sorts of endeavors and such. And then you get to discuss stuff with me who is relatively not anywhere near as knowledgeable as you are on these subjects. And then I get to represent the people who wish they were asking you these questions. And we have a conversation in an effort to bridge the gap, understanding that you, you come from New York, you're all understanding of this world. Y'all say stuff like, you know what I mean? And we are the guys over here who are not in New York. In fact, we even have somebody from Norway who's now started watching. Like, it's to the level oh, of that's how little people know what you mean. And a lot of times when you say that, because they, they just had no way of knowing before this, this like, interview or whatever. They don't know. So that's, that's our goal here is to bridge the gap in knowledge. And it, my oh. name is Holden Stefan Roy because I've also been terrible at remembering to say my own name. So uh, I remember to say it this time. That's amazing. I'm so happy to have you here. Um, and we're getting used to the idea of part two, so it doesn't, I guess, start off the same way. But as a little recap, we were going through Iron Solomon's story. He started off describing his incredible youth, his upbringing, all of the versatility in his music, the Stretch and Bobbito tape era, basically getting involved in music, heading out to college, um, linking up with great advice from Macklemore on playing the indie circuit, giving back to the community out there, being involved with end of the week and uh, making the effort to travel out there. And uh, I believe where we left off with your story is somewhere at the point where you're getting into battling and there's a bunch of tournaments and there were some greyhounds and then we kind of ran out of time. And um, I'm hoping that we could kind of like pick up from there and you could kind of start us off at that point. Uh, the last thing from your story that I heard in the interview was there was a tournament in a pyramid style and you were really excited that you won something. And that's about where we're at in the life story of Iron Solomon. Uh, so, yeah, I hope that was a helpful way to bring you back in a little bit. Um, so, yeah, welcome back. Yeah, I mean... Um... Yeah, I mean, after I, after I graduated from school, it was like 2005, um, got much more involved with EO Dub. You know what I mean? It was like coming home to New York and having like a, like a home base, a hip hop home base. You know what I mean? Um, and since I had been doing like organizational stuff at school, like event, you know, fundraising and event um, production and stuff like that, I started to get more involved with the like behind the scenes stuff you know what i mean writing um sponsorship proposals and um helping plan events and working at the studio at the dojo um as an engineer like doing recording sessions and stuff like that you know what i mean um yeah and really like linked up with vanguard and was just like writing and working on music every day pretty much um yeah that was that was like the next phase, the next like big chapter. You know what I mean? So at this point, are you still actively battling? Is this like at that point? Um, I know a bunch of big YouTube stuff starts going viral, and Iron Solomon's name starts appearing everywhere. Not long yeah. after two thousand five. Um, yeah, I think so. I came, so when I came home from school, the Underground Sessions DVD, which wasn't which wasn't like a like super pop and DVD, it was just you know, some dudes from the LES, um, my man, Bal and real six, real six is like a skateboarder, graffiti writer, um, Bal and his brother were like LES, you know, street dudes. I think real six is from, uh, hell's kitchen. Um, and I, I think I had seen volume one of the underground sessions, like in fat beats, maybe, um, I think I had it. And then, I don't know how I got in touch with them. Like, I think they might've reached out to me, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. You know, at the, t at the time I had been just going everywhere I could to battle. And so like, you know, 
anybody's that putting together putting together an event is like doing research or asking around yo who does who does what you know what i mean um i think i probably had battled at fight club at that point but the first time i battled at fight club it they like it, it, they did it was like a sideshow it was like a caucasian battle like they made me battle another white dude you know what i mean um right. so i don't yeah. know if that really counts but just to say that like you know my name was out there enough that they they might have they might have just reached out to me but i still wasn't like known and um yeah it was like right right when i came home from school and started uh doing underground sessions thing. And that was just like, they'd be like, yo, meet at the Virgin mega store at, at Times Square. And, um, you know, maybe something will happen. You know what I mean? And like you meet and depending who's there, it's not like set up. You don't know nobody's name. Like they're just like, all right, like you battle you, you know what I mean? <laughs> and the first one actually, again, they, like, it's funny, man. There was another white kid there the first night this this kid uh, or actually he, he i think he's colombian or half colombian but he looks white for all intents and purposes this dude madness um right. from orlando and i think they were like all right like let's get this out the way you know why don't you guys battle each other and you could dun each other off real quick and then we can you know what i mean <laughs> reduce the whiteness uh quotient in this um particular situation you know what i mean and i think me and madness was like the best battle of the night um but yeah, then they had me battle this dude, um, GS, G Sizzle, who was like a Times Square mainstay. You know what I mean? He was like always in Times Square. Um, and uh, Madness battled like a crackhead. <laughs> um, but then from there, it was just like over the summer, I would just randomly get a call from them to be like, yo, come to wherever like we got someone else we got someone else like it wasn't super organized you know what i mean so just so you know like it's really crazy that you like explain that because we were just watching those battles like Word. as in a couple of hours ago i was sitting here and i'm like all right let's click on that g skills one and we were discussing them kind of briefly like yo who won and we were picking things and we were like having a little bit of fun with it because yo it's right there on the iron solomon youtube channel which y'all can right. go subscribe to so yeah, thankfully yeah. you have it there for us. It wasn't even like anyone you have it there for us to go yeah, check that's out. Very, which is pretty that's fucking very cool. smart, by the way. Very <laughs> smart. Like uh that that's a that's a thing that doesn't exist that I've been trying to pitch to uh Penn as far as like trying to maybe like become the agent of battle rappers. Because right. battle rappers need to negotiate a contract for themselves so that once their footage has existed on the channel. It got put up on after a certain amount of time. They should, at minimum, I understand that the channel owns the footage because they they put up the money to make it happen, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that it's fair to say that after a certain amount of years, they, it should be shared footage for the artist as well mm -hmm. to be able to share on their own platforms so that they can use them as tools of uh, exemplary examples of their uh, abilities as artists you know and so totally. that's really smart yeah thank you yeah i mean i i negotiated that for grind time like i think i have the ens battle up there and that was like sanctioned you know what i mean but um Can i have not on that because like what you're saying well, this is really important stuff like now we're talking about in the, the equivalent of like licensing conversations and whatnot and um it is really interesting to me that it I can find these classic battles of Iron Solomon on the Iron Solomon channel. And let's say there's a lot of people today that are going to just come and start getting into this world and don't know a thing about ownership. So how did you negotiate this? Like if you can expand a little bit on what that means and how that came to be in your life, I think it would be one of those big time knowledge nuggets you could drop. Yeah. I mean, I think I just, um, at the time, I mean, this is mad long ago, like 10, you know, over 10 years ago for the ENS one with grind time. But I think I just, you know, they were offering a number that was lower than what I was asking for. And so, you know, I, I read this, um, there's this business book that's like in an app form called business secrets. Um, Flacco knows what I'm talking about. Um, I'm just going to bring it up so you can see it. Yeah. It looked, it, it looked like this and it's got oh, yeah. all these different chapters on, you know, negotiating and leadership and communication and management. And um, they even have like neuro linguistic processing, which is like all about the language you use and how it impacts your own decisions 
Oh, dope. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So like the chapter on negotiating, you know, was ill to me because what, what they, the biggest takeaway is like when you're just going back and forth on a price um, that's haggling, you're not negotiating, right? Negotiating is like mixing a record where you're like, yo, I need a little more bass. And the person's like, that's cool with me, but like, then I'm gonna want the snare higher. So like you would get what you want and you find a balance there, you know what I mean? And so like, I think a lot of people um, don't always look at the other things aside from the immediate cash or financial gain that you can get. Um, but I, I always try to look at like, you know, what's gonna, they don't want, if they don't wanna give me money, like maybe it's easy for them to give me the rights to put this on my YouTube channel after they've gotten their like big drop or, Maybe, I mean, it costs them nothing to put advertisements on their content, you know, so like there's many, there's, you know, it's like, what do they say? Like fast, um, good and cheap. Like you can only pick two things. Like yes, they if you do want it so. fast and good, it's not going to be cheap. If you want it fast and cheap, it's not going to be good quality. You know what I mean? If you want it um, good and cheap, it's going to take a long time. Like, yeah, we could get you that for this price, but I'm going to have to fit you in on the manufacturing floor when I have time. And so you're going to have to wait for a while to get these t-shirts, you know what I'm saying? Um, so you got to just figure out what's easy for somebody to give up. Um, and what, what is beneficial to you? Like it, it doesn't cost them that much to put an ad that I give them on the battle, but it benefits me like disproportionately to what it costs them. You know what I mean? So if we can find, you know, maybe I feel like what I'm bringing to the table is worth more than the money they're willing to give me, but then they can give me something that doesn't really cost them that much that benefits me more. I think definitely independent artists should always be thinking that way and definitely battle rappers for sure. You know, um, it's not just about like the bag as, as everybody says, like the opportunity can be, can lead to other bags in the future. You know what I mean? Yeah. Thank you so much honestly for sharing all that mr aaron solomon the truth of the matter is a lot of people need knowledge like this like i've learned a, i i even thought like when i started this process i knew a thing or two and i was wrong i got you you folks sharing this kind of knowledge is actually like gets all of us even people who know things already to even just rethink about their own situation and how they can make smarter moves like you you basically said find the best value if I can like bring right. it into like, but that the best value goes beyond immediate cash. Right. And I like that. Right. That's also huge to bring it back. Right. To what we were talking about. I don't want to, I don't want to have given the, the um, point to divert us without getting us back to his point. Right. Or what he was talking about. Iron. I think that this is a, a good opportunity for us to um, give a shout to madness. Word. Who is, you know, like, it's not like he's from our camp, right? No, um, yeah. Unlike most of your opponents back then, right, that maybe didn't stand the test of time or didn't have the what it takes to continue in the battle scene. The, um, like, Iron's battle with Madness, he won. It was the decisive victory, I believe. It was probably the battle of the night, right? Like he yeah. said, but... Um, I don't think that it necessarily showcased the greatness of Madness while he went on to then have a, an illustrious career, which yeah. not a lot of people after a defeat like that tend to have. There were a lot of right. people that Iron battled in that era that they're guys that were perfectly capable of continuing in battle rap, but for one reason or another, they did not, you know? Right. And Madness uh, is unlike those guys. Madness had right. a very... A very respectable career after that yeah hell yeah i love that man like definitely i uh, appreciate you going in that direction shout to madness and to critical his partner who, who was there that night too um they they have dope music together critical and madness um and they have dope music on their own and they're fire and critical won the first underground sessions dvd i think um or shirt and tie i think shirt and tie won the first underground sessions dvd but critical, it was him versus critical in the final in the final battle. Um, so yeah, shout to both them guys, man. And and from my personal experience, good dudes like show love, 
you know, real committed to the culture, the craft. Like, so I appreciate you taking us in that direction because definitely love, love to give flowers, you know what I mean? I just got to say, one of my favorite parts of these, like, era is when you're all are, like there and it's so fucking tense and you're all like going at each other. And then the second it ends, it's a hug. <laughs> like, the it second wasn't always it that ends. Way. I mean, yeah, at least the ones I saw, but like, yeah. th- those were some really like cool moments that you captured, even if it wasn't like always yeah. that way. That still shows so much of like a side of it that I don't think people see is that moment where like the the masks almost come off and like the people come out again, and that's a fucking cool thing to see. And I saw them in like your really old battles before the crowds, and like when it was Word. really sm- that was fucking cool. I don't know how many people look for that stuff, but that was one of my favorite parts. Yeah, I that's those are always good moments. I I enjoy that too. Um, but that's cool that you went there because, like, for you, a lot of this stuff is like, okay, battle raps is happening. And all, you know, for us, it's like, yo, we saw snippets. Like, this is about the era where, like, you know, in Montreal on YouTube, we're like starting to discover what the fuck battle raps are happening, and guys like Jin's name are starting to get said around and whatnot. And you know, at some point soon in the story, Iron. Solomon has that gin battle and you know things like that are happening so there's a lot of people who are very interested in the beginnings when you're running around the streets and doing your thing where for you it might be like whatever but to everyone watching this is very interesting stuff do you want to expand a bit about how it was like following that volume two like start walking us through a bit of your journey there yeah I mean real six shout to real six like he he had the foresight to like you know, put it on YouTube. And I really dead ass didn't know what YouTube was until I, until it started going viral. And I had people um, reach out to me and be like, yo, um, you got 40,000 views on this video and 60,000 views on that video. And that at the time that was like, great. That was big, really big numbers at the time. You know what I mean? So I think I was like the first viral battle rapper because of real six putting it on youtube so like i found out what youtube was after the videos had kind of like gone viral to the extent that they went viral you know what i mean and then i started getting recognized like out in public which was crazy um yeah and uh more opportunities started coming from that you know fight club i actually had gone and auditioned for I had my wisdom teeth out. It was like on a winter break from school and I had my wisdom teeth out and I like went and I auditioned or, or either I had him, either I had him like stitches at the audition or at the battle. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, they made me battle a white kid. I was, it, it, I was pissed because like, usually you go there and when you're like a rookie, it's like, you don't know who you're going to battle and you don't even know if you're going to battle. And um, they were like, rookie all right, rookie battle first. And like, whoever loses can't come back. And um, they didn't call me. So I was like, fuck, man, like, I'm not going to battle tonight. And then right before the, like, whatever the headline battle was, they're like, all right, all right, like, Caucasian battle. And they had me battle this kid, Ill, um, from Connecticut, who's dope, who's really dope, who still, like, makes music and he's dope. And he had been like, I think he'd been bodying everybody. I think even Penn, Poison Penn told me that he had gone there with Bollock and they had Diabolic battle this kid too, you know what I mean? And I think that he just knew the room and he was like doing the, like, I remember he he was doing the like, the only difference between you and a bag of shit is the bag. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was definitely like really accessible stuff. And I think because they were treating the like white boy battles like a sideshow, like that accessible stuff like would hit. Um, so I kind of had to change up my whole plan because I had gone in there, like Fight Club was like written, you know what I mean? So I had like one verse. That's the first time that I like wrote a verse where I was like, I got to come with a written verse. But I only wrote one round, which was like kind of weird. And um, I remember I went, and it was definitely like fight club oriented content. You know what I'm saying? It was like, I remember I what you're saying, what does fight club oriented content mean? <laughs> yeah. I see, I, I see Dama and I see Flacco and I'm like, Oh, they, everybody knows what I'm talking about. And ill answers in here. Um, 
but like fight club was was much more street you know what i'm saying like so it was like all written you know there's at the time there were like two factions pillars of battle rap one was like freestyle over beats um multiple rounds like pyramid style you know elimination to get to the end and the other was like written street battles where you're like just in the street um and it's more like street content you know what i mean more drug dealing gun shit you know what i mean like i would elaborate also because right i i didn't get the i didn't get to have my battles air right but um, I definitely linked a, a good portion of, I linked Sarah, Kana, and then she linked a good portion of like underground homies to the to the Fight Club. But basically like the thing that I always like to like cite about Fight Club was like, I went there and I was still freestyling. I was not in the battle circuit like you, right? So I was in a New York City street battle circuit, which right. means you just battle in the street with random people. And a thing that was prevalent in street battling back then was everybody battled the same way, which was I got my rhymes. It was what um, Mickey Fax was telling you, Holden, which was I you got your rhymes and everybody and one guy goes, the other guy goes, and you keep going until one guy runs out of rhymes. Right. But Fight Club was kind of like the beginning of the commercialization of that process. And so I went to Fight Club and did the same thing I would do on the streets which is I would freestyle against somebody who would come at me with written rhymes and they would come at me with written rhymes. They'd be like, you know, I blow, I blow, I blow that fitted over your head. Bow, bow, bow. And it'd be like, what, what, what fitted buddy? I literally have no hat on my head. You know, like what, what is this generic rhyme that you're bringing to the table right, right. against me with like, I'm standing in front of you. I have no. And so as you freestyle rebuttal it, the the cameraman I had the cameraman laughing all this stuff and then uh, international P comes to me afterwards and he he's like yo you did really good do me a favor don't ever come in here freestyling again and I was just like oh uh, okay I thought I did fantastic the cameraman was laughing I had the whole crowd like in the palm of my hand but that's not the mood that you bring to Fight Club Fight Club was you come with your writings I don't care if they're address directly towards the person or not, even though most of the times they weren't because they were usually opponents that weren't made aware of each other beforehand. Iron was in a different level. He was higher up. So I'm pretty sure like when he got the battle gin, he knew he was battling gin, right? When he got Yeah, at that point. But like most of the time it was like you got given your opponent on the fly, so yeah. so to speak. So you kind of like would have written that you hoped would like kind of hit towards that person, you yeah. know, but like you didn't have like stuff directly uh, uh, catered to that person and freestyling was not the move. And so in that crowd, you had a most majority of um, just street rappers. Uh, New York City is filled majority in hip hop with black and brown people. And that's exactly who was in attendance. And it was more of a MOP, um uh uh 50 even cent, like dip set like dip set type there was a lot of that kind of like you know mm-hmm. jack with the jack with the jack and the jack you know what i mean a lot of the like same bar like five times with different meaning you know what i mean that was the type of shit i was coming with like because i like i was selling trees at school and i and i remember i had this line that was like something about you know I, like you got co- just pennies like just coppers in your pocket like I hustled trees in a small town. I got the coppers in my pocket. You know what I mean? And that was like the style of the of the environment, you know. So, um, yeah. but then when that kid, when the when the kid ill started coming with the like more jokey shit, um, then I just totally freestyled and like was pulling shit from around the room and whatever it was, and I beat him. And I think he had been like beating all the white boys, and so I was like, yo, like. Um, I'm not coming back for another white boy battle. You know what I mean? And so after that, um, yeah, it was no more, no more white boy battles. Um, 
Yo, I respect you sharing all that. That was mad interesting. Also, shout out uh, Flacco for his insight because I feel like he's always a great uh, addition. He he has a good gauge of when there's good context that's not being explored, which I don't have being the guy who has the no context. So shout out Flacco for holding it down the way that you do. Um, do you mind answering a couple of questions from how people that have popped up as we're watching this? Sure, yeah. Uh, so your lady friend Bonnie uh, has said, was there much resentment in your life from people you've battled? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I'm sure there, I'm sure there is, but like for the most part, you know, like I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not that type of dude. Like I always show everybody love, you know what I mean? Even, even when it wasn't like, cause battle rap wasn't always like quite a community the way it is now where like people fuck with each other and there's friendships and like everybody, like their battles happening so often and they're and they're out of town that everybody's staying at the same hotel and the you know what i mean like that wasn't always the temperature you know um and even back then like i would call i would reach out to people um you know like i battled math and then we went to london i went to london i battled math on smack and then i went to i was supposed to go to london on a tour with fight club i went to london on a tour with fight club and um, Murder Mook and Math were both su supposed to come. And Mook told them he was at the airport. Yo, I'm booked to do shows out there, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, okay, like, let me see your work visa. And they didn't let him fly. And then Math had gotten into like an altercation the night before that was like some serious, um, it was a serious altercation. And I think he lost a friend of his and so he just didn't didn't show up. And then everywhere we went in London, they kept asking, oh man, I thought, you know, math was supposed to be here, whatever. And so when I got back, I reached, I reached out to math to be like, yo, like, um, I'm not a street dude like that. Like, I can't tell you how to respond to what happened, but like people in London is asking about you. You know what I mean? And like your man, would want you to pursue that opportunity i think you know what i'm saying so like i always just i always just feel like there's more that binds us than separates us and so like it's always been important to me um to just show love no matter what you know what i mean like it don't it doesn't cost anything to be positive and reach out and and you can create more um collectively than you can you know through separatism you know what i mean so i know there's resentment and there's some people that i have issues with just petty bullshit issues that I don't fuck with or I'm annoyed. They annoy me or whatever it is, but like nothing real, nothing, nothing that matters. You know what I mean? That's cool because I think it's also good to share that because I, you know, maybe some people are watching it and go, you know, like how there's that phase with wrestling fans when they're young where they think everything's real. Yeah. And then one day you learn that it's, it's not like necessary. I don't want to call it fake because I really respect the Wait, art what? of it. I'm kidding. I'm having fun. That was that was fucking great. <laughs> but like, you kind of come to realize it's not as real as you thought it was, and you know it's yeah. kind of scripted and shit. And you know, not to say that battle rap is scripted, but that it's there's an act element to it. There's a character that gets kind of brought it's into performance it. Performance art. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a better way to put it than anything I was saying. Because I'm like, shit, man. Somebody gonna get mad at me somewhere on the internet for that. <laughs> um, but like, yeah. And then the fact is, when everything's off camera, everybody's a person again. And that's like really kind of important to remind people, I think, in the big picture, because it helps them understand that this is a performance. This is just like a, a thing that people are really, really into. And I have to admit, uh, since we last talked, I've watched more battle rap. I've gotten more into it. And like yeah. even my girlfriend, like we were doing an album where she's like, I've gotten into the battle rap more. And now I'm starting to understand what's going on here with the bars and a lot of that is like watch, talking to you and she's watching this so she's hearing you and like you know we all learn from this so it's fucking cool dope we did have one more question if you don't mind it's from ismail gadamsi uh back when we we're talking about the grind time style you were describing how there's the streets and then there's other versions of styles out there and he wants to know like as a fan what is your preference which is your favorite style i mean i always loved both like to me I was like a holistic hip hop lover when I was a kid. You know what I mean? Like I used to sneak out the crib at two in the morning and do graffiti till the sun came up. Like I used to try to break dance a little bit. Like I could, I could scratch a little on turntables. Like I make beats, 
So for me, I was just like, I loved it all. Like I used to, I used to know people that were just on some underground time and know people that were just on commercial time. But like, you know, I would make mixtapes that would have like company flow and Jay-Z like back to back, you know what I mean? And I, so I was always into both. I was always loved both. You know what I mean? I think over time, you know, you kind of have to leave, kind of had to leave New York city in a weird way um, to find the tournament freestyle shit. Because I think like, like, I mean, end of the week held the torch for like, like underground hip hop open mic and their vibe is not, it was anti-battle. Um, you know, the MC challenge was not a battle. And like, I don't know why it kind of, the battles faded, but like you used to have to leave New York for that. So I think over time I, I gravitated more toward the street style because um, I feel like it ended up ultimately reflecting the environment more and speaking to me more because it just felt closer to the core of like, of where hip hop came from in certain ways, which is funny because I think people outside of New York, you know, sometimes when you're outside of a culture, you like, like you said, with wrestling, it's like, there's certain things that you interpret a different way and maybe take more seriously. And I think a lot of people outside of, of the city outside of New York, like made up their own rules that they interpreted that were much more orthodox than the rules that we had, you know what I'm saying? And so like, it's funny that the written street style was something that they would kind of shit on. I think a piece of it is a little bit of racism too. Um, and so I think for me, it's like just the, the language that's being used, the slang, the type of wordplay, you know, the freestyle shit really kind of went in a direction that was very like, you know, just joke jokes, a lot of homophobia, a lot of racism, you know, racist jokes at least that, um, and then the the, the kind of technical wordplay on the street side um, was a little smoother and a little more like mature in a certain way. And so for me, that just became like iller, more exciting. And then, and then also it's like, it's black and brown people that are the, you know, <laughs> the people who are driving the culture um, nine times out of 10. So like to navigate that space and to, to like be able to get accolades there um, for me, it was more meaningful than like going outside to this other kind of secondary interpretation of hip hop. Um, not to discredit it at all. It's just like, for me, I want to be popping in New York. You know what I mean? Like, I want to be able to respect it at least. I don't need to be famous, but like, yo, this dude gets it in and he's serious about the culture and the craft. You know what I mean? So I think if I had to choose, I'd say the street, the street shit, but I, but I really was a fan of both. You know what I mean? I really like how you answer that because it got me thinking and those are like cool answers. And it's just stuff I've experienced where now I have a lot of people who give me a lot of opinions about music. And there are a lot of people who call a certain kind of hip hop better, but it's because they don't understand the New York culture that led to New York hip hop. So they call it better. And often they'll use the word lyrical as though somehow other stuff isn't lyrical. Anyway, I don't think, you know, it's great. Just on the side note, the same people who will criticize hip hop lyric lyrical will then call like an eight word rock ballad like the right. most profound fucking piece of art and I'm like are you are you kidding like yeah, yeah. you do know what you're saying anyway lyrical there's so many words in a rap song like so many words it's a lot of fucking words it's a lot of writing you know what I mean um, and just and just cuz people don't necessarily understand what right. the writing is like here, here's an example like some, sometimes in Montreal, we forget that not everyone has our education system. Therefore, literacy rates in Montreal might not be the same as certain environments in New York. Mm. So maybe the purpose of music and oral storytelling has a different value in a society where the written word isn't the focus. You say that to people and they don't understand what you're talking about. I'm pretty mm. sure a lot of people do understand what I'm talking about in the call. But like I've learned that oral storytelling is powerful and so a lot of hip hop is parables and things like that that are using a language and a lexicon that the people who are intended to hear it will understand. Right. I might not be those people, 
as I sit there in my cushy ass office job and shit, you know, like right. I'm certain I'm not those people. It's still on me to not like judge that shit. And I, I say that cause I used to be the dude that would judge that shit. And then I met so many beautiful people like y'all and now I'm not that person. That's why bridge the gap oh. to me is so important because you sharing this allows this conversation to happen. And then maybe, maybe somebody out there hears it and they get inspired to see it differently. But I'm like really tired of that lyrical miracle shit being like greater. Just cause y'all okay. have a good thesaurus doesn't mean that you're spitting better facts than say like fucking uh, Conway the machine. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, yeah, you said that mad well and, and, you know, props to you for being willing to change. And I think that that, especially, in the States right now being more divided than ever, like the willingness to be open and see something from somebody else's perspective, I think is mad important. You know what I mean? And, um, and yeah, you know, like I I've gone through those phases where it was like underground or nothing for me. Um, it took me a while to like really understand what Jay Z was doing lyrically. <sighs> and I remember whatever the tipping point was where I was like, damn, this dude is the nicest. And it was crazy to go from like, he's vilified as like the purveyor of commercialism to, yo, this is my favorite, that he's the best ever. Like, um, and yes. you know, it's just all about it, perspective and the outer layer and the, and the branding and the way things are packaged and not necessarily the content. And I think also, you know, um, there's a reason that there's missionaries, like people like to convert everybody to feel the way they feel so they can feel comfortable in their beliefs and all that. But like, so I think a lot of it is like, if you don't understand, you're going to hate on it because it makes you feel lonely. You know what I'm saying? You're like, Oh, oh I like that I'm isolated from this. So like, I don't feel included. So I'm going to just vilify this. You know what I'm saying? I think a lot of the internal battle rat, like hate that came from the kind of like what you might call backpack or underground side to the street side was like not feeling included. You know what I mean? It's like kids that are outside of the culture. Um, and then there's some of the street shit, like what, like what, um, Flacco was saying, like them being like, yo, you did your thing, but don't come here freestyling. Like there, there is a faction of the street shit that was also shitting on the freestyle stuff too. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, I, think I mean, it's, it's like, all more inclusive now, you know what I mean? But that I think was it's mostly one... international P with just trying right. to make sure that like, he will, I think that, you know, he knew what he, at, at that point he was running a TV show. So he knew. Nice. There's no space for you to maybe mess up or something right. like that. Right. Yeah, because Flacco actually told that story on my interview with him, and it was really about making sure that the, the, the art form was elevated to the next level. And he said specifically it was MTV that put the pressure on him, and it wasn't actually that guy's idea. I can't remember the name even though you just said it. But MTV was like, nah, this is what it is. This is the only way it's going to go down. So it doesn't matter if you were dope. This is what they want. And this right. is how we're going to elevate stuff. So I, I think it's really, it, it's it's important to just look at the fact that there's all sorts of different stuff. I might, I don't know. I might be, it says partially correct. That's fair. I'm remembering what I remember. That was a couple months ago. Um, anybody who wants to like clarify stuff, that's super cool too. I'm like very happy to get a correction is all I'm saying. If you want to uh, fill in the gap, Mr. Ill answer. I was going to mention um, as far as like the, uh, the like animosity after battles and like that not being the energy like that was like he's right like that was not the energy you know battle rap used to be before it was uh on camera that was just something that happened in the streets which with like you competing with somebody else's neighborhood and essentially you were supposed to be embarrassing someone and like stripping them right. of their manhood essentially in front of their friends so it could be yes. very dangerous. So it was never that type of temperature of like, oh man, here's, yo, it's all over now, bro. Let me give you a dap. Like that's not the way battle rap used to end. Like before there were cameras, it used to end sometimes even in fights and very like violently, like, because again, you're essentially stripping another person of their manhood in front of their friends. And that's just unacceptable, you know? Right. So like that, that's, you know, uh, another part of the way that it used to be. And now things have changed and it's a, com it's a, it, you stay in hotels, like Iron said together, you're, you're, you, you're playing the same circuits together. 
And really people just view it as a sport now, where it's just like, I said what I had to say. I don't really hold any more animosity past this. But even mm. now, there's still battlers that you'll catch like one in a hundred battles where like at the end of the battle, those guys are still like, bro, don't fuck me. Don't give me no pound, bro. I'm yeah. I was dead serious about what I said. I don't like you. Some of the really old, I feel like a T-Rex or like some of the old school guys that come from that MOOC, like, you know, come from that tradition. Like keep it, they keep it traditional a little bit. You know what I mean? Right. Um. Yeah. So I don't know if he'll answer. I can't hear you. I see your mouth moving, but I don't actually hear anything. No, it's not working. Um, Maybe it's because you're freestyling ill. Maybe try your writtens. Maybe that'll come through. Oh, that was great. I appreciate that. Sorry for the technical difficulty. Oh, it says connecting to audio. That's positive. Now let's hear. No, nah, uh, it didn't uh, work. Oh, that was so hopeful. I'm sorry, my guy. Uh, I'm like, I'm... <laughs> Um, if we yeah. had sound effects, now would definitely be the time to hit like one of those. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fucking great. Oh, hold on. Uh, how about now? Yeah. Oh, we works. got it. We got it. My yes. headset works. There we go. Thank you for participating. Up, oh, up, sir. <laughs> What's up? So, um, you guys were talking about uh, basically international P and how he's basically uh, trying to make the sponsors happy, which is true. <laughs> of course um his ultimate goal as he spoke to me about was always to commercialize and get a, a full-time show on mtv and um make people pop so basically he used to have conversations with me about um my brother who was km back then um basically he wanted to put my brother on tv but he didn't think he would come off on tv so like we follow iron solomon we used to take advice from him to get there of course and um it was always these mystery people behind the glass. <laughs> it was literally a glass, a two-way mirror that you can only see one side. And it's always like a celebrity in there, quote unquote. We don't know who's in there, you know. And those people allegedly said that my brother doesn't make the cut. And, you know, one particular night, my brother did 20 straight wins um, in Fight Club. 20 straight. There was nobody left in the building. And he still said no TV. <laughs> so it was kind of it was kind of insane. And... I mean, essentially, whoever's behind the glass is somebody who's putting the money up and his investor is saying, no, I want somebody better, you know? So it's always really the investor that's calling or the different, shots in the background. Like, like, I think even better ain't even the right word. It's like- Different. For, you know, there you go. I think Fight Club, you know, they wanted it to be a particular type of street. Like those dudes that were behind it, they're like a Dominican like street family from the Heights. You know what I'm saying? They're like- okay. Yeah, so like I think that that. Sorry, was like, I have to ask. What is the Heights? This is a first oh. for me on this channel. <laughs> the, Washington Heights is a neighborhood like above um, Harlem on the west side that uh, is like largely Dominican and is like if you go up up to like Dykeman, um, a lot of a lot of rappers would get their weed from there. Like when you hear Pude, um, that that came from there. They used to call it P eighty nine. Um, I think even um, Br was Branson up there in the Heights or is Branson was Harlem? I, I, I'm not sure. But um, but yeah, just like, you know, a lot of drugs came through Washington Heights, this neighborhood. Um, and so I think the dudes that ran it, you know, they were like come from a legacy, a street legacy. And um, I think they probably wanted to see that vibe re represented, you know what I mean? Um, so I do. And shout out Nunzio for... Me. You know what I'm saying? That's why they fucked with me. Yeah. Shout out Nunzio for... Because uh, I saw his face go, no, 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 I know where Branson's at. And I knew that Nunzio knew where Branson's at from teaching me on his episode about who Branson is because I didn't even know who that was. Um, okay, yeah, so Branson definitely Harlem. Harlem. Yeah, that's what I thought. Definitely Harlem. Yeah. Um, but that's still great, man. I like the fact that we keep bringing up this stuff because we're teaching people who would otherwise have no idea that these things exist. So it's fucking cool. Like, I'll be honest, I have more context for uh, for what all these different rap groups or the, the different rap battle leagues are as we discuss them more, as you discuss their intentions, as you discuss this one is zero, this one's focused on the street stuff over here. And it's like, it's cool to see all of these different circuits that existed. So you as a, as an artist in this game are... I guess athlete. It's like a rap athlete. That's kind of what I, I kind of feel like. It's like it's cool. 
um, you get to kind of figure out which of these lanes is best for you. And it's like, I like that. It's it's not to keep going back to wrestling, but it's kind of like how wrestling has like 17 different leagues. So whatever the fuck you want, there's something out there for you as a fan and there's something out there for you as a performer. And that's so cool because it's so much deeper than I thought when I was like, yo, there's like KOTD back in the day. I don't know anything else. I'm in Canada though. So for all y'all out there, I'm in Canada. It's like I'm supposed to know what a KOTD is more than the other things. Right, um, yeah. I was about to co-sign you hard. I was about to co-sign you hard. Like that's understandable. That's you're, yeah. if you're in Canada, it may yeah. and you're not necessarily into the battle rap scene, right? It would yeah. make sense that the only thing for you to know about battle rap would be KOTD. You know, yeah. it'd be like it, a kid. There's a lot of kids that I explain to people all the time. Like there's kids in New York City that they have no idea what any of the underground hip hop stuff is going on. They have no idea about industry people. They got no idea about like EO dub type of shit. Like they got no idea about none of that stuff. All they know about is URL and like indie street rappers, you know, like they know 22 G's, they know chef G, they know these guys drill in Brooklyn. They know what's cracking in the Bronx with the upcoming guys, but they don't know enough. Like they, they don't know. They're like childish Gambino who Kid right. Cudi what? You know, like they don't, they're, they're unaware of those guys, let alone an immortal technique or a tech nine or guys like that. So right. it, and the same way that those people exist in New York city, I would imagine that there would be people in Canada that would be like, I got no idea about battle rap, but I've heard of KOT. Right. Mm. Oh yeah. yeah. It's definitely kind of the situation is, I mean, don't get me wrong. I've heard of a URL and a smack. But these are just random words to me. They have no like real association. I know people who have participated in KOTD, so it's a little more of like, okay, like it's a thing. It's actually like a good thing, you know? For all I know, this other stuff is in the internet. I couldn't tell you where anything's located. I, I just assumed it was all in New York, and then I found out it wasn't all in New York, and I'm like, oh, man, that sounds big. And I don't know, sometimes when you look at a giant universe that's already existing, like, there are people who look at the Marvel Universe and is like, I'm never watching 30 movies. I'm out. And that's the facts <laughs> of the situation. Personally, that's me. I'm looking at that like I'm never going to catch up. It's okay. Y'all can enjoy that. I'm over here not not getting into it. Battle rap's worth getting into. Don't even get me wrong. It's fucking a great gold mine, especially if you're into poetry because some of the greatest poetry I've seen in terms of creative bars I have discovered watching y'all come up with insanely. Yo, the Matt Hoffa battle. That little bit about math you did for a while, like the, the course curriculum shit that you flipped off of the math, like that whole verse is like you put that over a beat and I know a bunch of kids that would call it like gold on genius. Like if that's, on, if that's not on genius, that needs to be put on genius so motherfuckers can like annotate it and geek on it because it's some right, fucking yeah. fire shit. You do battle rappers use genius? Um, I, I, had, I was talking with a dude for a while who used to put battle rap stuff up there and he would reach out to me and I would like clarify lines and I'd send him the verses and shit like that. So there's definitely some stuff up there. Um, and yeah, you're right. I mean, to me, um, battle rap is like the highest level of the manipul of the, you know, manipulation of language um, period, like in history, you know what I mean? So like it's be way beyond Shakespeare or anything like the, the level of like, the wordplay and the double and triple entendres and the referential, you know, it's really, it's really crazy. And you, and it's easy to miss. It's easy to misinterpret if you're not like tuned in, you know? All right. So let's go into some more entry level battle rap questioning. Cause we got an expert here. And I think you have a Rosetta stone capability that um, you, you can bring to the table. That might be very helpful. Why? Are so many people doing gun bars and violence bars and stuff? Let's say, what is the interpretation so that the average person who goes, it's so violent, I don't understand why it's all the same thing. How would you, because I could explain it, it would be awful, but I bet you could explain it with eloquence. I mean, you know, I think that like there's an element of hip hop that, you know, it, it really does come from the street and like originally it like wasn't cool to be a rapper and then rappers started like talking about um drug dealers lives and hustlers and being kind of like narrators of um you know it like and then slowly drug dealers started being like well i could just do this myself like i don't need this guy to tell my story like i can tell i can tell my story 
And then I think, you know, when there's a story out there, I think human beings like fit themselves into an archetype. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, are you going to be the Abercrombie and Fitch dude? Are you, you know, in, are you going to be the five panel polo dude? Are you going to be, you know, champion and Tim's guy or like, you know, Pharrell comes out and now you have permission to like be a black dude that's got a skateboard and there's like an archetype for that and it opens up another lane. And I think people, you know, violence is exciting and like street shit is exciting because I think that human beings, like so many human beings, like just go with the flow or they take bullshit from their boss or they, you know, don't know how to carve out space for themselves or be assertive in their life. And so to have a window into an environment where somebody or a person's mind state where they're not doing that, or they're not allowing themselves to be disrespected, or they're willing to do something violent and they're okay with going to jail when that's like a terrifying prospect for a lot of people. There's something about that. That's like, like super appealing. Um, and, and, you know, there is something that's like a little racist about it too, where it's like, you know, there's an objectification piece of it, but then I think people um, copy it because they don't know how to, they're like, once you see that this works, it, it's like, it's like this going back to fight club, right. And having somebody behind a glass door, that's like, this doesn't work on TV. Any story of a person like of that you hear of a person dealing with a record label that wasn't, um, didn't fit into a certain mold they were told by a record label, this ain't going to work. It's different. And so there's a million people getting into being creative and hip hop and battle rap is a narrative, a, a personal narrative sport. It's a, I, you're telling I stories, you know, it's not like, um, you know, Aerosmith, uh, Jamie's got a gun. It's a, that's a story about somebody else or um, Pearl Jam, Jeremy, where you're writing a whole song about somebody else's experience that you didn't even know. It's like, these are, I, yo, oh, I did this. I did that. My man, this, my man, that. And so I think people don't know how to create a narrative that's compelling in the context of that art form um, without following like a pre-existing archetype. You know what I mean? Or people struggle with that. It's like, this is working. And so that that's what works when you battle rap you got to be violent and so people only know that lane and then some of the violent shit is fire so like you when you when you you know if i'm listening to cameron for a whole week i'm gonna start writing bars like cameron like by accident you know what i mean if i'm listening to some super underground if i'm listening to nas my cadence is gonna switch up like if that's all i'm listening to you know what i'm saying so if you're watching battle rap and motherfuckers got fire gum bars you're gonna be like i want to write up some fire gum bars like i've clapped the blicky or whatever the fuck you know what i'm saying and like um it's easy like it's easy it works you know and, and i think it's the same thing like when everybody was doing homophobic and i fucked your girl and race jokes it's like you see what's working and it's easy and so your people are drawn to that you know what i mean you know what was super interesting is again as you were talking you got my brain going which i fucking love <clears throat> And I made a little observation that, again, is anecdotal and is definitely not meant to imply everybody. But I certainly know a lot of people of a certain way of life who tend to not like, let's say, New York hip hop uh, or the, the street shit will go, I fucks with Nas because he's telling other people's stories. Mm. And then those same people will shit on Jay-Z because of his own storytelling and, and, and exactly what you were just saying. And then I, I just like I feel like you just unlock this level of understanding across the board because I never thought about it quite like that before. But I think you're right. I think a lot of people have trouble with people who have actually done the actions and how it becomes morally acceptable based right. on their life. Like, look, in Montreal, there was this kid who was doing well. We're talking like million views of video legit type shit. Like he's he's got a condo when he's 19 type shit. He's doing very well. He taunted the cops. And he ended up getting a little bid for him. That's a, you know, it's nothing. He's, it's probably the, I, I was thinking about it, like, that's actually probably great marketing for his fan base. He taunted the cops and went to jail. Like, I mean, if you can't flip that story, I mean, it is what it is. But like a lot of people were really judgmental about that on my post about it. And they were all of a certain economic 
status. I'll, I'll say middle class lifestyles, the house and kids types. And they just thought it was reprehensible that in any way jail could be promoted. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's based on your understanding of morality. But like if that kid sacks three years and makes a million, that sounds like a pretty solid investment. It sounds better. Like sounds like a better three year investment than university to me. Mm. Now, I know that's not like a morally appropriate thing to say, and I'm not encouraging anyone to pursue jail time. I'm saying in this one kid's instance, based on the facts available to me, I came to that one conclusion that in this one time, maybe that's a good business adventure for this one kid. <laughs> but nobody liked yeah. that. I mean, we could definitely we could go down a whole path of uh, prison industrial complex and how you know the um, normalization of of prison in black and brown and low income communities. Um, That's and I interesting. Think, yeah, I mean, you know, there's this like um, Malcolm Gladwell, I think, book um, where he talks about you know over a certain percentage of people in a community. Um, being incarcerated means that each individual knows or is related to X number of people who are incarcerated and that um, over this certain percentage, there's like a tipping point where it becomes more likely to go to prison because it's just like what everybody does. You know what I mean? And so like where I went to high school, it was like, yo, which college are you going to? And it wasn't really a question. So you wouldn't, it would have been like, weird to be like nah i'm not going to college you know what i mean so like college was normalized um and i think that you know prison has prison through systemic oppression has become so normalized that it's like a stripe that you earn or it's a badge of honor um or it's just like a rite of passage you know what i mean like yeah like you're gonna get arrested a bunch of times for um whatever like that's just part of being black or being from the hood or whatever it is and like um that's just normal you know what i mean it's like oh yeah like i was talking I mean, even, my... just to like add to what you're saying i read this book called the ballad of danny wolf and it's talking about a native american in canada part of uh, a gang called fbi and the only way to elevate in the gang to the leadership was to do a hard bid you had to do a hard bid on your record and so basically the entire leadership of the gang is in jail and I didn't know that that's even a thing that could ever happen. So imagine right. you're in a universe where the only way to achieve real power is to be locked up in bars, right? right? I didn't ever think about that one time. So just to like add to what you're saying in terms of the normalization, at least in some communities, that's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Also, um, uh, oh, answer said that that Malcolm Gladwell book that you're mentioning, Iron, is uh, Tipping Point, mm. which is also right. That's the uh, root, the yeah, so I, I noticed that I said I said they're that coming is, tipping yeah. point, but I was at the ones I I've never read tipping point, but that's supposed to be an ill one. Um, There's and, also outliers and talk, don't, talking um, to strangers. I, I read um, David and Goliath and Outliers, and then I read the most recent one, which I think talking is to called, strangers. Talking to strangers, um, yeah, which was one. crazy, but but I didn't like because there was just it was just talk. It was a lot of stuff that was just like hard to hear about. Okay, no, here's my problem with that book. I remember I started reading the book and I was like, okay, this is what the book was about. And I, sp I you can ask my girlfriend, like she can show it up in the chat in the Zoom if you want. I just spent the whole book going, what the fuck is this book about? And it was right. a lot of interesting facts of stuff. And I think like there were some interesting points made, but I didn't really understand what the fucking point of that book was. Whereas yeah, Outliers was super clear. fucking it clear. It wasn't as clear of a like, this is building up to his thesis as the other books that I've read from, from him. Yeah, it was just like, okay, you said a lot of a lot of stuff and then you toured and sold your book. And I'm like, okay, that's what it is. Now, don't get me wrong, no disrespect to Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, I fucking no, love I didn't his like books. That. I, didn't really like, I didn't really like the book. I, th I think my takeaway was that everything exists in a broader context and that in our interactions as people need to be kind of like, made a little more relaxed so we can give each other the space to have the leeway of the context. Um, and then also that there's a certain degree of assumed trust that's necessary for communal living. And that if we just distrusted everybody, like you couldn't function, 
you know what I mean? Because right. he talks about all the kids that were like abused, you know, sexual abuse by the sports coaches. And it was like, we can live our lives using that as an example of the world being a horrible place. But then like nobody would go to soccer practice ever. And like this world just wouldn't, you would never send your kid to with a babysitter. Like, you know what I mean? So but yeah, it was there was just some horrible shit to hear about too. Like that. Yeah, was just... like I got I got this takeaway of people be drinking way too much in parties these days. It was a big <laughs> thing I remember from that book. Like it went in so deep that I'm like, yo, maybe there's a problem there that nobody's actually talking. Oh about. yeah, with college like sexual assault stuff. Yeah, and like the pers- like people because like all those college movies in the '80s that everyone remembers the good old days. The alcohol percentage is like you know right. beer. And now yeah. it's hard liquor being shot back and then talked about metabolism rates of males to females and how these ladies right. are trying to keep up with dudes in some like equal front, which is probably bad news bears in alcohol land. And then <laughs> so the rate of blackouts in these mob environments has increased substantially from what all of the parents remember of good old partying. So basically all the 40 year olds and 50 year olds, what you think about of a college party is nothing compared to what these kids are doing right now. Yeah. Plus the pills and the lean and like all the other shit that they're mixing up with it for sure. Big facts. And it's also accessible. Um, and e- even with weed, right? Like if you follow the history of weed percentages, right? The weed I'm smoking today would knock a motherfucker out right now in the seventies. Just knock him yeah. on his ass. It's like literally 10 to 20 times stronger than yeah. back in the day weed. Yeah. I've uh, actually been mixing like CBD flour with the regular flour because I think that the, from what I understand, like probably the hippie weed back in the day was like a heavier CBD to THC ratio. And that might be part of like why the hippie vibes were so strong. You know what I'm saying? So I've been like Mm. trying to kick in and I like to smoke as like more than I like to be hot. Like I, I I would smoke a whole, like I would like to enjoy you, my man, a whole blunt and not necessarily being like a whole blunt's worth high. So I like mix it a little bit. You know what I mean? That in this case, I know exactly what you mean because I real I was sitting there as I was like today having that conversation in my head. I'm like, I wonder if there's a way I could buy like three times as much weed at like a smaller percentage and like triple down on chain smoking. Like, yeah. I wonder if there's a way because I mean, basically, it's a math equation, right? If you're trying to achieve X amount of THC, there's got to be like a happy ratio where everything fits right. in. I'm not necessarily that interested in pursuing this deeply, but I was thinking about it today. So I'm glad you brought that up. (laughs) Yeah. I'll I'll look up where I got, I ordered like two ounces of CBD and like, it looks like the most popping fucking weed. Like it's smells delicious. And it was like 40 bucks for like two ounces. You know what I mean? Um, Interesting. I I could tell you, I could tell you for sure that the, um, sorry, I could tell you for sure that there's definitely, it's a, it's a whole market and there's even um, people abusing that market of where right. like they'll sell you um, CBD weed with THC sprayed on it mm. and act like, like, they, you know what I mean? Like, like it's just weed. To, yeah. Like it's just weed. Like it's high grade because it, like you mentioned, it looks, it, looks really, yeah. it looks really pretty. It looks yeah. really pretty and it smells nice, yeah. but it doesn't give you that kick that you're looking for that, you know, Mm. regular THC weed gives you. So like for them to spray on a THC and then sell, like there's a whole market of it being flipped and, you know, because not too many people are in the market for it. Uh, It got real popular up here. Like I know a lot of people because it's legal, right? So now it's like kind of cool to jump on that topicals for your back pains and shit. That's real fucking cool. I don't, because in Quebec, it's not legal to have topicals, so we can't go by that. I just had to, like, look at what other people did. But, like, Philip DeFranco, uh, who I watch on YouTube, and he has, like, a huge-ass reach, was talking about fucking CBD topical fucking back pain. And I'm like, wow, we've hit that point with CBD. Where it's, like, mainstream news shows on YouTube are fucking sponsored by topical CBD companies. I'm like, fuck, eh, that's where you know it's mainstream. Yeah, I go to a pharmacy that's in, like, an old people's building, (laughs) and they got CBD everything, and it's, like, people with canes that are, like, you know, CBD but yeah, they have the weed in Quebec for sale. The CBD weed is fucking expensive. I was like, at one point, I wanted to just buy it to try it, but I'm like, fuck that. I smoke pot for my THC. I don't know that I want to put up thirty bucks, forty bucks to try to try something that won't get me high. 
You know what I mean? Right. Like so, I don't. But you know, you make a compelling case for the hippy dippy shit. So maybe I'll yeah. maybe I'll give it. A I just mix it. it. I mix it. I don't smoke it on its own. I just I mix. I'll use it to stretch the good weed and like make it a little more, a little easier. You know, ease the high. I feel that. I enjoyed this tangent, okay? I'm just going to say it. This was great for me. I think it's important to show people that we're all complex with lots of ideas and shit. But I do want to go back to your story. Well, you know, because it is fucking interesting as you're doing all this shit in the beginning of battle rap. So let's say we're in that, like, 2005 to 2008 range. We've discussed a little bit about how you started getting more opportunities in your life. I'm wondering if there are any crazy moments or things that you remember that you think would be cool to share with the people out there. Yeah. I mean, one of the illest moments was like, I was with Vanguard from EO dub and um, I think there was an EO dub in Cali. I forget why, like exactly why we went out there, but there was some event out there and um, it was right when three six mafia like won the oscar they won the oscar right they did for, um, for that it's hot out here for exactly so we were on the plane with them to to cali and that was just kind of bugged and then we land and we were chilling with um van's boy Smokey, who was like from jersey but living out there and he was like working at a, a porsche dealership or something so we were like riding around in like a drop top porsche and it was literally like the first night we were there and we were on, you know, some major boulevard with palm trees and high as shit. And uh, <clears throat> the, my phone rings and I'm in the back seat and I pick up and his dude is like, yo, it's Ted Chung. Um, I'm Snoop's manager. Like Snoop wants to talk to you. And like, it's a, it's a Cali number, but like the type of friends I have, like they would call me and say that. So I was like, I like put Snoop on the phone, you know what I'm saying? And I was like talking like Snoop because I was like, you're not going to get me with this bullshit. So I was like, for shizzle. Like it was, it was like after all that, like that era where that's like how he was talking and rapping. And so I was like, for shizzle dog, like what's up homie. You know what I mean? Like, and he's just talking to me and I'm talking back to him like that because I think someone's like fucking with me. And after a while, I'm just like, yo, like the ruse has gone on long enough. Like what? Like, and then I'm like, yo, hold on. We were playing free net. We were playing NEMS. We had the free NEMS CD. Um, and it ended up getting left in that Porsche, which I think is mad funny. So somebody who bought the Porsche had a NEMS CD like in their, in their stereo. <laughs> um wow in a, in a sense that. that's like straight out of entourage yeah so like i'm like yo turn the music down and they turn the music down and i put it on speaker and i finish the conversation on speaker and it's and um i hung up the phone and they're like yo who was that and i was like i i think it was snoop like i they said it was snoop and they both were like yo like I think that was Snoop. And so, and it was turned out it was like, I was just tripping, like talking to Snoop, like I was Snoop <laughs> for mad long before I like put it together that I wasn't being fucked with. And, um, later that night at the, like what he had been asking was like, yo, are you like, it, I, I was like, he was in New York, I think. And I was in Cali, which was funny, which was just like weird too. Um, and he was like, oh, I'm flying back to Cali tomorrow. Like, if I put together a battle, like, are you ready on the go? And I was like, yeah, let's, let's make it happen. You know what I mean? And uh, then later that night, Ted Chung, who is Snoop's manager and his, like, business partner in, uh, like, um, the record label. Like, they're, they're – he's, like, a, one of his business managers. You know, I know that there's a lot of people involved, but Ted Chung is, like, a has been at least a significant player. But Ted Chung called me later and then was really, we had a conversation and then we, we met up with, with Ted Chung and, uh, I didn't, I didn't get to meet Snoop, but, um, he gave us a beat CD and we like went to the studio, um, where Snoop records and like recorded with Ted Chung. And then actually the next day, Busta Rhymes called me on the phone and it was the same shit where it was a blitz 
who was Busta's manager at the time, was like, yo, Busta wants to talk to you. And it was just like, yo, what the fuck is going on right now? And um, yeah, I was in Smokey's crib. Oh, and I have a question. Oh, yeah. When Busta's manager called, did you like take it more seriously that second I took time it. around? <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't do the Snoop voice to Busta or the Busta <laughs> voice. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, that was crazy. And then the story that I heard was that Snoop and Busta – and Q-Tip had all been like at a show in New York and were at the hotel just like smoking weed and, and like binge watching Iron Solomon battles. And so <laughs> the, next, the next day they must've gone their separate ways. And each of them kind of was like, Ooh, like I'm gonna make some money with this kid. And like each kind of had their own, like, Oh, I'm gonna reach out and see if he's signed or see what, you know what I mean? And so, that led to the back-to-back, -back, you know, Snoop and Busta phone calls. Um, and, and Vanguard was there for both of them. And, like, you know, he could tell you that those stories were exactly exactly like that, you know what I mean? Um, so that was that was a crazy ill experience and definitely Yo, was one of those I... moments where I was like, damn, like, shit is getting to a place where I didn't realize it would get to in this way with battle rap on YouTube, you know what I mean? Like... I that is, that is pretty yeah. big. Like yeah. when I said like a cool story, I wasn't expecting that level of cool story. That was yeah. like, we got comments saying it was dope over there. Also, shout out Adam Nuisance for the follow. I appreciate that. Um, but that is that is, like, so like when I hear your music and you're like talking about how you feel like a million bucks now and all this other shit stuff, it's like you're adding in the context to justify a little bit why you were feeling the way that you're feeling through stories <laughs> like that. Because, yo, I can tell you one thing. If anybody, I talk to Nunzio and you and feel like a million bucks right now. That's Word. how I'm at in my life. Like people are like, I've heard of Iron Solomon. I used to watch his battles and stuff. Yo, Iron so you're talking to Iron right. Solomon? That was like a real conversation in my life. Word. And I'm going to keep having that over and over again as I throw your name around for cool points. That's dope. Yeah, go for it. Run with it. Um, so it's dope, man. I, I, I just think that's that like, I, I can almost relate to it because of you. So Word. thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, what other stuff was going on around then? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's probably when I started to get into like event production and stuff. And this, this like, it took, you know, I didn't want to get like a full-time job, um, because I wanted to be available for recording and making music. And so I started picking up, um, freelance work doing like, um, even like brand ambassador marketing gigs where you're like standing, handing out flyers or handing out like samples of fucking sunscreen and shit like that. And, uh, you know, um, then I started doing more like actual behind the scenes production where you're like loading in events or loading in, you know, marketing activations. And, um, I learned to, you know, I fucking, yo, can you drive a, a, a 16 passenger van? And it's like, sure. Like I'll do that. You know what I mean? Learn how to drive a van and be doing this production work. And then we did some work in tower seven, which was weird because it was like not too many years after 9-11 and they had question yeah what is tower seven so tower seven is the third tower that fell during the uh 9-11 whatever you want to call it attacks um and uh it's one of those pieces of the puzzle that makes people like myself very suspicious of the whole scenario because it's like multiple blocks away and um yet it just fell even though it wasn't hit by airplanes and like it's the only bu other building in the area that just like magically fell to the ground and had like a huge insurance policy on it and nobody really ever heard about it and then they rebuild it mad quick and the you know um so yeah uh I so mean, just to, to your credit i sincerely had no fucking idea what it was and yeah. i've watched joe rogan talk about this subject multiple times Right. And I still have no idea what it was until you just yeah. said it. <laughs> yeah, it was another tower. And it was like where all these like financial records were kept. And like all it had this like huge insurance pot. From what I understand, it had this huge insurance policy that was taken out like right before 9-11. And um, it wasn't like highly publicized. And it just crumbled to the ground. It wasn't hit by an airplane. It just fell to the ground, you know, which is right. like, you know how buildings just be falling to the ground and shit. 
Um, yeah, just... oh, but yeah, so we, we were doing some work in there and I showed up to a shift and they were like, can you drive a box truck? And I was like, sure. You know what I mean? Uh, got in a box truck. The, the lead had printed out directions from like map quest, you know, there's no GPS on your phone and he didn't look up. He wasn't from New York and he was, I mean, now I'm realizing he was probably mad young, even though he was like older than me at the time. And he printed out regular directions, not commercial directions. And so it sent me on a, you know, completely wrong, illegal route that went through bear mountain um, and so I was on like a one way, or like a, a one lane, two way road on the side of a mountain in like a snow blizzard illegally in a box truck the first time I drove a box truck. So, um, yeah, just getting into production and then eventually started um, a event production, event, a, a, a labor staffing crew staffing company because I saw that. Um, a lot of the clients that were hiring me and Vanguard and another friend of ours to do um, production work were hiring us because we weren't afraid to get busy physically, but we're also like analytical and can communicate and code switch and speak to a, to, you know, a union crew um, who's like blue collar, you know, third generation union white dudes or um, speak to the other crews they had, which would be like 16 year old kids from the Bronx and then turn around and speak to the client. And like, since we know so many people through music and just through being in a city that don't want full-time work and want to have income and be flexible, we were like, yo, why don't you let us, like you hire us to supplement these crews. Why don't you let us put together a crew? Um, and so after like a year of, of begging a friend of mine who was a director of operations or in the, at the time, probably just in the operations department um, at one of the main companies I was working for, I just begged him for years. And eventually he was like, yo, I made a case for it. And um, here's this job you guys can do. And it was like 16 people in a warehouse um, doing packing boxes for bib pickup, which is like, if you have a race and people sign up for like the marathon or sign up for like, you know, a 5k to raise money for breast cancer or something, you get shipped a box with like your bib number and the safety pins and the t-shirt from the race. And so they needed 16 people to just pack up all those boxes and send them out. And within like a half an hour, I called back and was like, yo, I got all 16 people. Like, here's the list of names. Um, and then actually that, that, was like half people from the Heights um, because my, one of my best friends I grew up with is from um, Hillside Avenue, which is right off Dykeman, which is like the top neighborhood of the Heights Dykeman. And uh, um, he, he brought like all of his peoples that we grew up with. So, so yeah, from there, you know, I was focusing both on business, running a business and creating, creating music. And I, and I think I formed, um an llc like production company around my music with some partners and an investor and it also had the llc for the event production stuff and was kind of like juggling both of those things um yeah that that was no, like that's like amazing so let's just stop for a second because like yo you you said a lot of cool stuff but here's the thing i'm seeing nunzio's face so i noticed a parallel between you and nunzio Keep in mind, this is Nunzio in, in the story of how he got to be working at Bad Boy and the engineering and stuff. And uh, you both said yes to, like, everything. And mm. you both were able to code switch and adapt to the people you worked with without fear. You were both were willing to go above and beyond in the circumstances. And you both sought out cool opportunities with an open mind. And a lot of good stuff happened. Like, I mean, you just kind of casually dropped that you ended up with a couple of companies and, you know, a lot of, because LLC is like company, right? I think. Yeah. I mean, I'm not that big on that part of life right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Limited um, liability company or. Yeah. So like, I mean, how many people have come on here? I mean, you don't know the answer to this, but not many people have come on here and dropped out. Yeah, I've got two separate ones. I've separated my life. I've got this shit that's going to pay my bills. And then I got this shit for the music. It's separated intelligently. Now, I understand what you're doing because I structured my life in a way where I tried to keep shit separate too. So some stuff's riskier than others, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I, I kind of understand what you're doing here. 
But I just have to say, like, you're young, I think, when you're doing this, right? Like, this doesn't sound like you're that old when you're pulling this off. I mean, in my 20s, in my mid-20s, I would say. Yeah. I would argue that pulling off two lim- limited liability companies in your mid-20s is in the equivalent of boss-ass shit that deserves more flowers <laughs> than maybe some of your battle rap legendary stuff. No offense to, like, that side of your life, but oh, thank I you, hear you going this, and I'm like, shit, I only got my shit together in my early 30s. So still I'm trying not, to get my shit together. <laughs> I would argue uh, you got your shit together. I mean, I've seen some of your interviews where you talk about how you're a dad, and I, I heard you talk about growing your hair out to be in solidarity with your kid, and you were dropping sure. these big time parenting tactics, and you were that to me was like, that's a guy who's got his shit together. I've got to take notes for this shit. My kid's gonna thank you, man. Alone. I appreciate you know, that. I'm like, I think I can give it give advice better than I can take it. So it's just yeah. kind of. Eh, I just, you know, you notice things. And, uh, I mean, to me, I'm looking at a guy who I'm like, yo, I'd want to be like Iron Solomon one day. Maybe not the <laughs> battle rapper side, but, like, your life looks dope when I look at it. So it's like, how can we gain that wisdom, you know? Like, that's all those books, right? Like, when you read a lot of business books, it's just guys who have accomplished it telling their story, mm. right? And people totally. don't know how, like, those are all the number one fucking books on, on like, whatever, right? They're just people right. who tell stories of success, is Iron Solomon not a story of success? Everyone, everyone knows that's true. Okay, like sure. there's no way to deny that because you're you're not young and you're still doing. That sure. is success to me. Longevity. Sure. People still to your day are like, I don't care about your origin. I just care about that right. dork. You know, like people can do that. I can fuck. I'm I'm quoting Iron Solomon's classic battle from like I don't know when that is. You know that's dope. Work. Can we talk yeah, about that battle? Cause yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I think like, you know, we spoke about a lot of this stuff in the, in part one, which, which everybody should check out if you haven't. Um, but, you know, I'm super fortunate to have grown up like with parents who had careers that weren't like on the beaten path. And so I was exposed to what's possible, you know what I mean? And I was encouraged to see what's possible. And I think so many people, um, so much of our culture is oriented around scaring people into mediocrity and warning people of the dangers of the world and like making you feel afraid to be unemployed or afraid to be broke. Um, and I think that like for me, you know, I, I would struggle to have a nine to five job. I'm kind of scared of that. Like, you know, I, I, there are jobs I think I should probably apply for that it might be cool. But like, um, you know, for me, it was just like, oh, the first time I smoked weed, it was like, well, I should get a lot of this and like sell it to other people who smoke weed. You know what I mean? And then some kid threw a party for a school event. And I was like, yo, we should throw a fucking party. Like I'm going to just call up these nightclubs and see what's up. You know what I mean? And like, I think I've been super blessed with the privilege of being exposed to that and being exposed to parents who saw what could be and um, pursued that, you know what I mean? And I think like so many people move through life to avoid consequences instead of to pursue results, you know what I mean? And so like, my thing is always just like, yo, like shit, shit is possible. Things are possible and fucking morons and assholes like succeed every day doing shit. Like, let's try it. Let's figure it out. You know what I'm saying? not even gonna lie i do know what you're saying this time because like i said <laughs> you sound like all those you know fucking me. books my guy right. all the books basically say what you just said yo your idea i mean <clears throat> the other part of it is the hard work ethic yeah. i mean like just describing how much time it would take to get to an eo dub event or all of these like this is yeah. the ethic you put the time in you put the work in it wasn't just random but the other side of it is the perspective and I think you created a lot of opportunities in your life because of that perspective. You went places. Also, you traveled. Like you yeah. did, you learned about the small town circuit, not in New York, not in your home. You know, yep. you, you left. These are just things people can pinpoint in your life that show where you gained experience and knowledge nuggets that allowed you to take it. But if you go back to that always say yes mentality, yo, that's one of my biggest pitfalls as a human is I'm kind of like a no, think about it, yes guy it's better than i used to be i'm not quite at a just jump on new ideas guy yet i still struggle 
with that a lot. It's like, nah. Oh, okay, I see what you're trying to say. I was gonna tell you to 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 not sell yourself short. You know, you could jump in the battle rap too. You know, if you if you're gonna go full, you know, hey, I want to be like Iron Solomon one day. Yo, <laughs> oh man, throw I don't, I see, ring, I don't know, man. This the first time somebody would scream in my face. I think I would I would maybe cry or something. And then <laughs> you have that on wax one time. Yo, people still talk about that time. Fucking uh, what's his name? Read the f- cannabis. Read the fucking poem. Right? Like, oh uh, yeah, that, yeah. People who don't even fuck with battle rap here, but I don't want that. I don't want. I c- I can handle that as a songwriter and sell it. Like yo, that brings girls. I don't think I can do that in battle rap. Like that's just like I don't think I fully realized how intense the culture was until like I watched footage of me like with my Jewish mom like battling flames who's like a had no t-shirt on and has like huge scar on his face and like I'm yelling I'm telling you know I'm saying that he was like sucking dick in jail and like he definitely was in jail and that's like a super foul. You know what I'm saying? I was like as my mom was watching, because I was like, yo, you should see it. It's dope. And then I'm watching it. And I'm like, oh, my God, like her poor heart. Like she must be so concerned about me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm out in these streets fucking telling people about their jail time. Like this is crazy, you know? Um, so, yeah, I feel you. I see in a chat that so said the Detroit trip. Um, yeah, we went out to Detroit. That was ill. It, that was similar time because it was when nems was locked up and bizarre um from d12 it used to be bizarre and proof but i didn't get involved until after um proof had passed uh rest in peace but um yeah so knows probably the more of the full list of people i think but it was me him um dayton latin who was dayton's manager at the time um jayhan and AZ Blaze. I don't know if I'm missing anybody. Uh, so you could chime in. But um, Eternal. Eternal too. Eternal, yeah, yeah, yeah. E. Yup. And who battled? Who battled? It was me. Um, e battled. And we were we were like I was rooming with um Ham too, with Hami Ham. Um yeah, we all went down to Detroit and Bizarre was like hosting this a rap battle down there, which was really dope. And like Swan was there and Marv One and Quest McCody. Um, and they showed mad love, man. Detroit was always like super supportive. And had you gone down there before that trip? Yes, I did. Uh, and we actually was on when we shot that, we shot a video to Nems and, and Bizarre's song, and Proof Work. was there. We actually kicked it with him like a couple of weeks before he passed. Damn. So that was really dope. Yeah. We have some footage of it. So I should try to get that. I just yeah, that's, say, Ill, like, that's fucking cool to me as a huge D12 fan. Like, I don't Earth. mean like Eminem fan. I mean, like, I like all six of them for different reasons. Earth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Bizarre's the man, bro. Like, he's honestly one of the most, like, humble and um, hospitable people in the, like, industry that I've ever met. Because they were super fucking popping at the time, right? I mean, this is like, you know, 2000, what? Like, eight nine four like back then 2005 yeah 2004 right, yeah, okay. that is maybe 2006 huge. when you went right so like eminem is on the top of the fucking world like um yeah it's like they he he and they just throwing these underground fucking rap battle events you know what i mean and showing That's mad cool. love like putting heads up in hotels and yo you need anything you hungry you want to you need weed like they just always were so um yeah, it's so hospitable, man. It's and, just- the, and the Detroit OGs was out there, too. Like, the URL guys, like, fucking, um, um, what do you call it? What's his name? Forgot his name. Fucking, uh, the, all of the Detroit dudes that battled Lux. Who, the dude that battled oh, Lux. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 Midwest Miles. Yeah, and, Midwest uh, Miles and um, X Factor. X Factor, yeah. Yeah. They showed us mad love, too. They were mad. They loved us uh, out there. Yeah, they was- appreciate this. Yeah, I dude. don't mean to cut you off. Is it all right if I just take a quick washroom break, if everyone's okay with that? Oh, yeah. Eternal just said it was 2005. He just texted me. He's listening in, too. Who, who said that? Eternal said it was 2005, oh, right yeah. after the MC challenge that he okay. we, we left right after that, I think. We right. had the MC that challenge. Night. Yeah, that night. We left. Yo, literally. that's crazy. I didn't remember that, yo. That's ill, but that's, yo. 
we drove like overnight. We dipped right away after the MC challenge. Yep. That's yep. crazy. I, I was trying to piece that story together because somebody posted a picture of all of us on Instagram. I did. You did. Well, yeah. Yeah. Etern yeah. had Etern has a whole collection of shit of us. You got to see the the relics he has of us. <laughs> Man, yo, I got to see that stuff, yo, because I still I know he he just put up Mr. Nice Guy on uh the platform all of streaming. Bad platform. guy, just a bad Mr. guy. Bad guy, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I have the CD with I have the original CD. Like I got to dig it up because it's in one of those huge books. But like I saved all that shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. Damn, you're right. We left that night. That's crazy because it's a long drive to Detroit. Yeah, you got to go through Ohio, all types of shit, man. That was yeah. crazy. Because the, the the one before, because you were saying about the van, you're learning how to drive a van and shit. Yeah. Uh, which was funny because the, the time before that, I don't think you were with us. We actually rented out a van. Yeah. <laughs> and, so it was like, we you always had to figure it out. Van together. Yeah, that was fun too. Yeah, yeah. The <laughs> passenger joint, the like church van. Yeah, I still, we still, I still fucking, we watched it on here. Uh, the, the, when you battled Avalanche, uh, when yeah. me and Jen are standing right behind you, wow! Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> you yeah. watched it on Zoom like uh, about a week or two ago. Oh, that's dope, man! That, was, that was such an ill trip. That was so fun, man. Man, that was so humble. It's, everybody was out there, man. Humble it was so fun, man. Yeah, yeah. I was just I've been getting on uh, Clubhouse, that like talk app or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was in a room with Bizarre the other day, and we were like talking about all of that shit, and he was like same thing he's mad regular like shows mad love you know what i mean that was that was that was dope man it was, those were those are some like awesome times you know what i mean A great time yeah, yeah. man Sorry about that. and then, then we went to we, uh there was a time that before you went to we went to saint andrews and we were chilling with conniver and all of them chilling upstairs and this is when when miles was calling out lux to battle Word. And that and and literally Jay Han was filming them and shit. And I guess it got to I don't know how it got to Lux, but wow, I don't know how that happened. But uh, yeah, they booked the battle. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. Had, 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 have any of y'all been down to the um, Philippines to see these guys? No, I haven't. But I speak to Jay a lot, and I know I seen you on uh, in, uh, IG Live with him uh, not too long ago. Yeah, yeah straight up like that, an arrow. <laughs> that's that's our brother, man. I love and Mike Swift too, man. He he comes yeah. back every once in a while, but I think Jay is stuck out there because of his visa and shit. He hasn't like oh, came word. back in like eight years, so we got to pay like mad money to get back in. So he's like, oh, I didn't realize that. And he's staying. And he has his daughter now. So yeah, Jay is. If you haven't, if you don't know about Jay Han, y'all check out Jay Han, the most charismatic, funniest dude to be around <laughs> as yeah. uh, Solomon with a uh, with Cosign. I'm pretty sure. Oh my god! What a, what a, what an energy to be around, man. I I really got to go to the Philippines and fuck with them because, like, one of my best friends from college that I used to live with, um, is Filipino. He's half Filipino, and um. When he was going to the Philippines a bunch of years ago, and I was like, "Yo, this is mad random," but like some of my peoples live down there, and like you got to link with them. And he went and like chilled with Jahan and Mike Swift, and like for a dude that like never met them to like go to the Philippines and chill with them and get shown a good time, you know what I'm saying? He, his mind was blown by like how much of a character he is, and like you know they took him to like. Uh, nightclub that had like midget boxing and like one of the midgets is like Jahan's like girlfriend at the time and like you know what I'm saying like he made a, he made a song called my little angel that was my little guy. angel <laughs> yo my boy came back with all this video footage of him like wasted being like yes my my little angel my little angel <laughs> he was like I and Solomon's we yeah, here with yeah, the boy yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yo, if you ever, if we ever, you know, this when this pandemic is over and shit, I'm definitely down to go there with you guys and shit. That'll be. Oh, a, I'm gonna go, go out there, fuck the whole country. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, hell yeah! Yo, we gotta do that, man. That would be ill as a, as a crew trip. That would be crazy, man. Yeah, he's the fucking man. Um, he's he's an ill example of like, you know, everybody having their own flavor. You know what I mean? Like, in, at, like I feel like you know, the internet made it where everybody kind of uses the same slang and it's, it's a little more like global, but back in the day, you really had to develop your own style. And like Jahan literally has his own way of talking. Like 
He talks Literally. like a baby. Like he's he, he's got his own accent. Yo, what up, Don? How you <laughs> doing? <man? laughs> My favorite shit was like, he'd be like, I'd be sipping. He was like, I'd be sipping white wine, sniffing white lines, getting so fucked up I can't even. I can't white even lines. bite vines. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. But yeah, like the originality, yeah. man. Like, dude had, uh, you know, he has his own like fucking language and shit. Dude. Yo, his Instagram is mad entertaining. Yo, he rode up on somebody in, in his like pedal car the other day, and the guy had his back to him, and he and he just snips the guy's fucking uh, headphones with with a pair of scissors and takes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jay's right. great. Oh, that's Deep Burns. So, what up, Burns? I don't mean to. What's up, uh, Iron Man? Yo, I was just kicking it with. Uh, Sev one, you know Sev one. Uh, I know Sev two. Now nah, <laughs> uh, Sev one, uh, the writer. Yeah, he's in film. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah, I, you know, it just I had to get the file straight real quick. Of course. So yeah, he, yeah. That's his little I'm, brother. Exactly. DJ, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good dude. Yeah. He DJs for Flavor Flav. Exactly. Exactly. But yo, back to the show. Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, that's really cool though, because there's a lot to. For me, it's it's interesting, because like for we we Google a lot of this shit after, right? Like you dropped a bunch of names I've never heard. I don't know what the hell any of that was. Like you guys just went <laughs> off on some People inside think, joke yeah. shit. And shout out to Deep like, too, because like that that whole there there's a whole chapter in there when I was working with Vanguard, where um, Burns who was who was just chiming in was DJing and producing for us, and he comes from a lineage like a, a lineage in New York of hip hop where hip hop was overlapped with punk and hardcore. And it's like, it just, does. yeah, kind of. Nah, I, I was into hip hop. I only got into hardcore when I was like 17, 18. So I was, you know, I was born 71. So since 79, I was fucking with hip hop, maybe even before because I followed graffiti. But I just mean, even back then when they're rocking like the studded shit and like, I yeah, feel but like I was a little later than that. We were more like the, uh, the hard hardcore kids weren't so much punk. We were more like we look like Cypress Hill, but right. we had box cutters and shit. Yeah, but yeah, he like I learned a lot about piece certain pieces of the culture and certain production things of layering. Um, like I was kind of always scared to use drum breaks because I would want to sequence my own drums and burns open my eyes up to layering a drum break to mix it all up like a fucking bowl of pasta exactly yeah and also you know i i grew up with rock you know i play guitar i grew up with rock and with hip-hop and i always sort of struggled to like you know know how to balance both of those mm -hmm. um like identities or like you know because there was a time where it was like the hip hop kids and the rock kids don't fuck with each other in school. And, Oh, you listen to this. Like, I'm not fucking with you. And I always kind of fucked with everybody. And now all the hip hop guys look like fucking, you know, everybody got their hair dyed and everybody know. looks like us. There was nobody had tattoos before 1994, 1994, New York city tattooing was illegal. Until right. then. Wait, right. what? And no, hold, the up, only, hold up. The only people who had hog, who had tattoos back in the day was, Sailors, pirates, and punk rockers. Right. Motorcycle. The way that they have too. now, like on your face and your neck and shit like that, like prison tattoos. When you see kids in the street, uh, back in the in, in in the early '90s, we were the only ones with tattoos. I stopped getting tattoos at one point because I didn't want to look like my friends because they all got their fucking faces covered. I didn't want to end up. I was like, I gotta look different here. I'm gonna stop. Right. Mm. Yeah, I was gonna also add the other two groups of uh, people that were always tattooed back then would be uh, mo motorcycle gang guys. Yeah, bikers. And, like, that's the same, same shit. Bikers and that's like a pirate. And people and people who've been in jail. You know what I mean? That well, was that's, totally, they, that's it's the birds of a feather flock together. Yeah, exactly. It was never. It was never that. It was never what it is these days. Today, like, it's like buying people, a pair of fucking when you when you got George. tattoos, you were saying something about where you wanted to fit into society, which is to, to say you didn't want to fit into society and you wanted to be outside of society. Right. And that's what that used to represent back then. Yeah, yeah. but for the most part, you know what it really does when you're a kid, you're like, look at me. Oh, you want to get your dick sucked or whatever, you know. It all comes with that. <laughs> yeah, um, I definitely think there's a huge affiliation of noticing that guys with tattoos attract the uh, females. 
And so, people but even get, though it was crazier in New York because it was illegal, so you when when I started getting yeah, tattooed, I, no I, I I had to go to somebody's house and shit. You know, I just never even knew that tattooing was illegal. So I mean, that even explains so from much like 1940 about, to 94, I think something like that. But like that just explains shit why like corporate America, right, would then perceive tattoos the way it does today because you know people. They have, it has such an irrational hatred, in my opinion, towards tattoos. But a lot of corporate culture really stems from New York. Let's be real. Everybody's copying New York in terms of the culture. Um, and so if at a certain point it became indoctrinated that tattoos would prevent you from rising to an executive level, yo, all the people that are running shit today were the guys that were like on the come up back then. Right? They all hate this shit. But they're the ones with all the power today. And I bet there's a fucking correlation between tattoos being illegal in, in the 90s and fucking people hating kids with face tats today. I bet there's just a correlation there. Just because of I hate kids with face tats. I, I hate them. I don't hate. But I mean, I think it's just so stupid because th- that's the first tattoo they get. They get on their face. Like back in the right, day. Right, the rules are gone. If, like If I put a shirt on, you, you're you not going to know I have tattoos. You'll see. Yeah, I you have better a have your whole body covered. Like before neck. you get kids, get their face and their knuckles and their neck, like before anything else, take off their shirt and it's blank canvas. I'd make them all get their dicks tattooed first. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I don't know. I don't have any tattoos, so I don't really feel like I'm entitled to have that big of an opinion on this. I'll give you uh, mine. Dick tattooed. But uh, when it comes, the needle scares the shit out of me. I don't care. Anyway, I know Bridge some of y'all gap. are like. Bridge that gap. S- sorry? Bridge that gap, you know? Yeah. I don't know Tattoo if I'm going to get a tattoos. But yeah. uh, I guess that can work. <laughs> Fuck, man. That was like the most derailed I think I've ever gotten here. But that was great. <laughs> I'm entertained. Um, That was interesting. I'm really fascinated by the illegal nature of tattoos in general. Yeah, Damien, yeah. what's your shit? Like, what? Yeah. where can people check your shit out? Because, like, like I, to finish what I was saying... <clears> oh, these 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 it. maniacs here all know and they're very familiar with my antics. Not my maniacs on my side who are watching also who have never heard oh, of yeah, them. Oh, uh, yeah. You Damian just have Burns, a super distinct voice. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I forgot, you know, Canada. Uh, Damien Burns. <laughs> Damien spelt with A's and Burns with a Z. Cool, Instagram, man. that's it. That's it. I got a lot of music up there. Check it out. You'll enjoy it. Maybe you might dance and shit, too. Yeah. I uh, definitely look forward to it. Thank you, uh, Flacco, for sharing that to the Twitch chat. So it's going to pop up on screen. And that means even in the futures, it's going to pop up on screen for everybody in the world to hear that voice and see those letters. So shout out, Flacco, Bayo, for making that happen for all of us. Because, yo, I'm definitely going to do that. If nothing else, you have one of the most interesting voices I've encountered. I can listen Maybe to you talk for, you know, I guess that's what it is. Um, yeah, you should yeah. interview Damien if it makes sense, man. He got stories like crazy, bro. I would love to. I mean. We're going to get Yeah, there. I'm down. I'm down. We're I spoke to you there. once before. We'll do it. We, I remember because that voice is so distinct. I like, I think it was the first Nunzio 33rd, interview. I'll meet you over there on 33rd and 3rd. <laughs> over there, over there? I don't know right anything that. What does that mean? You just said stuff and like your golden Jenny's in Norway. Solomon, tell him, right. tell him. So it's just like got... New York shit, man. It's like it's like this. that was an address, thirty thirty and thirty. Yeah, exactly. It's across streets, and we used to all the time joke about over. It's right over there, and you'd be like, over there, over there. Yeah, over there, over there. It's like the. It's like you know what I'm saying. I mean, it's like the stuff that people it's just right like, over there. It's over there. You know what I mean? And like. <laughs> you just know where it is. <laughs> Yo, this that's is some New sound York bit shit. shit that's quintessential like... New York shit right yeah. there that's happening. Yeah. That's all that that is. The same so... way that Namin. Right. Sometimes you don't Namin what I what I'm trying to get you to Namin. Right. That's that's the same exact thing. Right. So now I'm, I don't I'm know putting it. it on though. I, you know, I'm putting it on though. When I when I do the thirty thirty and thirty, I don't really talk like that. Well, man, I probably do. It's pretty close. <laughs> It's, really it's pretty close. It's like you can hear the slight exaggeration, but it's a slight exaggeration. Um, yeah, I know. Nah, well, I, awesome. I, lo- I love your presence. It's a great presence. You're a great addition. Honestly, I love anybody that's going to come through and drop knowledge nuggets up in here. Anything that can lead to educational slash entertaining moments. I mean, what else are we doing? We're having a conversation. We all fucking collaborating and growing our minds together in a space. Every, everybody that's talked on this call to me felt like they added value. That's my perspective on the situation. 
Yeah, hell yeah. And for me, you know, I don't get to see these these guys a lot or, you know, some of them I haven't seen in a while. And so it's it's dope, man. And like I wanna, you know, I only we only have like a few minutes left, but I just wanna give everybody their flowers, you know what I mean? Because, you know, like I said, you know, Damien played a huge role in in shaping how I see production, how I see hip hop and I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, um being able to reminisce with shows who like I saw on a mad regular basis all the time with Nunzio, you know, hanging out at the dojo. Um, these are classic times, you know, eternal Dama. Like these are people who for me definitely shaped who I am as an artist and as a person. And like, I value those experiences so much and I just appreciate y'all. And I appreciate um, seeing everybody's face and hearing everybody's voice in the chat and the perspective that every everybody is lending, you know what I mean? And um, shout to Flacco for making it happen. And oh my gosh, he, are, yes. I mean, he already knows the layers and the eras of our, our friendship and relationship and through music stuff. And the, the um, you know, I love what he's doing right now. I had, I had my bandana, but it fell off. But I, I love uh, what him and Jess are doing. And, um, you know, shout to Vanguard too, who's like probably, you know, one of the, one, the most influential person on how I write lyrics and, and was my business partner in the, in the labor company and all of that stuff. And all of this, Bengali bros, the yeah, Bengali bros. Uh, and all of this is through EO dub, you know what I'm saying? So just like shout to the, the larger EO dub family, um, rest in peace device, um, you know, uh, Rest in peace to Pumpkinhead, rest in peace to Sean Price, rest in peace Jay Arch, rest in peace Majesty. Um, yeah, man, just love everybody, appreciate seeing everybody, like for real. Um, at, let every, you know, if there's a, a knowledge nugget to take from that, it's like, just be open to as many, you know, be open to people and learning from them and um, don't don't assume somebody is one way or that somebody has one specific thing to offer you in your life because I think each of these people um, have offered me different things and at different times and it wasn't always what I was expecting to gain from them right and I continue to gain from them even when I haven't seen seen them you know what I mean like I, I've thought about souls and 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 thought about those experiences and it's it's given me something like i i haven't seen damien in, in a while or worked on music with him in years and i'll think about things that i learned from him you know what i'm saying so i think like just you oh yeah no it. doubt but the yeah. thing that was crazy is like i i i worked with you and then i i guess i didn't come to your house for like six months and i came there and you were just you got you had a like a whole sound symphony going like you were making funk records and shit you were like making <laughs> records re making records that you would sample that was ill shit bro you were way more advanced i was like damn this guy's fucking out of his mind <laughs> good looking man i appreciate that i mean for real like a lot of a lot of the stuff i picked up from the production from you is still you know it's still in my tool tool chest but from me? what i saw you took it way to the next fucking the fifth dimension you know I, I appreciate that, man, coming from you. Thank you. I just got to say... Thank you, uh, sir. Thank you. Yeah, but thank you, Iron Solomon, though, because at the end of the day, you're the reason everybody congregated here today. I mean, I do this week over week, uh, and so uh, not to say anything else, different crowds of people come for different people, and every time there's a crowd of people that seems to show up on the Zoom here, and so... It's really you that created the moment to let all these people come and have this little reunion. Because, yeah, sure, it went in that direction, but it was like watching you reminisce with people. And I'm like, yo, that's actually kind of cool. How many of us get to see, like, a behind-the-scenes of what it looks like for Iron Solomon to let his facade down for a second and chill with his homies? So yeah, the whole yeah. world just got to witness that for a second. And that's fucking fire, honestly. People, oh, we have one question for you. Yo, that was whack mind. what Murder Mook did, man. Yo, Iron Solomon had balls. <laughs> so I did have one question um, from the the comments, if you don't mind a asking, and it's because yeah, yeah, sure. we, we were easy. watching. We'll wrap it up if you want. We can totally do that. Um, <clears throat> we were watching the battle, or whatever you called it, a battle with Immortal Technique that happened at end of the week, and it looked like Big Zoo was not very thrilled with that moment. I don't think that was like a side of Zoo I'd never seen before. Um, but so he, so I watched you guys do your thing. 
and we were going, I don't know if Immortal Technique won that personally. We were both going, you know, I think Iron Solomon kind of took that on some creative, like, you fucking clearly spun the moment type shit. We just wanted to know uh, who you think won that moment, if you don't mind chiming in. Yeah, I mean, that story is wild, like, because EO Dub didn't do battles, you know what I mean? It was like, their, their whole thing was like, we don't have to go against each other to prove our MC skills. It was the MC challenge, and at the time, I, you know, I was, nobody knew who I was, really, like, I had been fighting for recognition within EO Dub and, you know, trying to get a higher spot on the list for the open mic and get into the MC challenge, and Immortal Technique was already, you know, he'd already won Rocksteady, battle and gone and you know he won bragging rights and i think he was already really selling records and had like you know the the beginnings of a career and he was known he was somebody and i think you know he was um sort of the one who was supposed to win the mc challenge it was like right okay we got this big name in here he should really win it you know what i mean but the way the mc challenge is is judged it's kind of anybody's game, which is part of what's ill about the challenge. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I, I won the challenge and he was pissed. Uh, he, w- he wasn't, he didn't agree with those results. And so he like took the mic and was just like, yo, fuck that. Like anybody who like, he got the crowd on his side, which is like some real hip hop shit to do. It's like MC, you know, move the crowd, like master of ceremonies, you know what I'm saying? So he was like, yo, anybody who, who thinks I won, make some noise. And like, he's a mortal technique. The energy is there. And I'm sure there's plenty of people who thought he won also, you know what I'm saying? And so the crowd goes crazy and he's like, yo, anybody who wants to see me like battle, whoever says I didn't win, make some noise. And I think that zoo and um, vice and pro it was just the energy in the room was like, yo, we have to let this happen. You know what I mean? Um, and but they weren't happy about it because they it's it, that's not their thing they really are not um it's not about the battles for them you know what i mean and so it was a reluctant like yo this could happen and i think again you know tech was thrown off because he expected that he he was to you know he felt like he had won i'm this little fucking white kid with glasses you know what i mean and I think he just was like, this is going to be a cakewalk. All, like we have to battle. And I, I thought I was going to lose too, because this is before I really was battling like that. It was like, I had done bragging rights a bunch of times, which was like a legendary battle in New York, but um, I never won. Like I, I got to the semifinals and then um, got knocked off and there hadn't been a bunch of battles in New York for a while. So, you know, I had these bars that were like, you would always have like a punchline here or there that you could like mix in. So I had one or two lines that I like hadn't gotten to use in a battle. And I think just cause he's like, who the fuck is this kid? Um, I'm gonna just mop the floor with him. And I, in my head was like, fuck, like this is going to be embarrassing. Like he's going to win. And I'm a, I got first place, but now I'm gonna have to walk away with second place here. And um, he, he was trying to get me to go first and zoo like put his foot down and was like, nah, like he won on the card. We're letting this play out you're going first, you know what I mean? And he went, and I, I think he wasn't in, you know, peak battle form because I'd seen him, you know, tear through plenty of people. Um, and he just kind of, you know, gave up, rock some, gave some bars and whatever, and it wasn't the best he could do. And then I think because the energy was behind him and then the attention shifted to me again, like little white kid with glasses, like I benefit from that element of surprise and so right away when i like me just saying anything good um and then i had this line you know the only time you get five mics is in a gay orgy which is like you know five mics in the source five mics in the source was like the rating system back in the day like the source magazine was the hip-hop bible and five mics was like a perfect album so that was like a bar that i had that i was like yo like I never got, I never got to use this in a battle. And so everyone went crazy and then the energy shifted and it was behind me. You know what I mean? So, um, that was kind of one of the, my introduction almost into the battle scene in a way, even though I had been around and been involved before. And again, shout to FYL, fuck your life. Cause back in the day, um, NEMS won bragging rights. I remember George Burns 
uh, being in a, in a bragging rights with the fucking football jersey and the bandana before I was like, before we were friends, because this is like high school, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old. Um, yeah, but yeah, you know, I, I walked away with the win. Um, but shout out to Technique, man. I mean, he's a fucking legend. And he's, I think, in terms of underground, independent yeah, hip hop, is like, you know, one of the most one of the biggest like model success stories. Um, and it was, you know, it's an ill moment and, um, it was a crazy situation that it panned out that way. And, um, yeah, it was, you know, it was just dope to be in the challenge with him at that time too. You know what I mean? And just to add a little bit to the idea of ownership to tie it up, you can find that shit, at iron Solomon's YouTube channel, yes, sir, follow, good. subscribe and do yeah. that because here's the thing. It's very important to capture your history. Immortal technique is a legend. You know how you know he's a legend. There's not a hard, there's a lot of stands in underground fan bases hardcore stance that won't let anybody else be considered good immortal technique gets the pass in all of those communities if immortal technique works with their guy he gets elevated every time there's very few people with that level of respect in the game in the underground that i've seen outside i'm talking about like the internets immortal right. technique is like fucking like he, I almost feel like the longer he waits to release his album, the more it's going to grow 10 times platinum when it drops. And he's being the biggest tactician in the world because he knows that if he drops it in, whenever he does, it will maybe possibly break a certain other guy's records that holds all the records because he's playing it like a G. I'm just throwing it out there. It might not be true. I know your time is precious and you got to go. So I'm going to wrap up now. Thank you so fucking much for coming through. This has been another great conversation. It went in so many directions I wasn't expecting, but I think that's the best part. Now that we had that first time, we can just talk and, you know, and hopefully you want to come back again in the future because I would love to sure. still give you. I feel like we're, we're not even into the next decade yet, right? There's that <laughs> much more of your story left to capture. But even with that, man, you, you spoke so many truths and your story brings so much inspiration that the more we can talk, the more we can educate people on different things. And I think that makes it a blessing for me. I become wiser. Everyone watching becomes wiser. I'm not going to lie. Having interview with Iron Solomon doesn't hurt my life. Um, it's, it's a great it's a great situation. And I don't oh, know. I'm I like glad. the fact that to quote you from your last one, we can create value out of time. And that's mm -hmm. a beautiful thing. Um, so for all of you watching too, uh, thank you for being here on the different platforms, the Zooms, the Twitches, the Facebooks, the whatever you're watching on, wherever you're watching. Without y'all, it's not the same thing. So knowing that there are live audiences actually makes this more lit for everybody. I'm just going to be real with you. It's like the closest thing to a lot of us can even get to a show anytime soon. So thank you for making that part of our reality. Uh, feel free to check out the end of the week, all of the platforms, uh, EOWTV on all the stuffs make sure you go like and follow them they're very important people because without their gracious hostingness this wouldn't be here without their community this wouldn't be here you'll see iron solomon shutting out end of the week all throughout his career and it's amazing um he comes up he's just a big he's just he's just cool that's what it is so thank you for being cool with us appreciate yeah, you yeah i've also everybody who's in the chat shout out their socials too so people mm. can follow them um yeah if anyone just wants to like unmute and, and shout out your socials that would be just like unmute and say what you got to say while it's getting picked up that would be the easiest way i think we could approach this you gotta know me i got a show on here anyway you'll be challenge every set uh every thursday at seven soulful souls dope um <clears throat> i know we we got nunzio who you can follow at nunzio um I don't know anybody else's socials. So I guess with that, we'll, uh, we'll say thank you all for being here with us. Totally appreciate you. Looking forward to the next time. Honestly, look, glad you did this with us. It's so cool of you. And y'all live long and prosper, everybody. Mm -hmm.